In the beginning, God. Before there was, there was God. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Then, God spoke. At his command, light emerged from the darkness. The light he called day, and the darkness he called night. Then God separated the water from water, creating a vault he called sky. The waters under the sky were gathered to one place, and dry ground appeared. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. From the land arose vegetation, plants and trees, and every green thing bearing fruit, each according to their kinds. Then God placed lights in the vault of the sky to give light to earth, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also created the stars, calling them all out by name. The sun, moon, and stars shone brightly, reflecting the brilliance of the Lord. God filled the seas with every great creature with which the water teems, and God placed every winged bird in the sky above. Then God created the creatures of the land, livestock, wild animals, and all creatures that move along the ground, each according to its kind. God saw all that he had made, the heavens and the earth, the lights of the sky, the crop of the land, and every living thing beneath the waters and above. And it was good. But one thing was missing, God's most beloved creation. So God created man in his own image, raising him up from the dust of the earth, but it was not good for man to be alone. So God created woman from the flesh of man. He breathed his spirit into humanity and together they reflected the image of God. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and rule it. God saw all that he had made. And it was very good. Amen. That's a great video. I uh, was so taken in by that video that I almost forgot to come up here, actually. I was just sitting down there. So <laughs> if that video wasn't enough of a hint, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 1 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them to Genesis chapter 1. And we're continuing in our This I Believe series in which we explain the important, essential, fundamental teachings of the Bible. So today we're going to be talking about the doctrine of, or the teaching of, creation, God's creation. And in doing so, we're going to answer two huge questions that many people have about the world that we live in. The first of those questions is what is known as the fundamental question of metaphysics. And that question is, why does anything exist? The fact that you and I can look around us today, the fact that we can see this room right now and the world around us means that there is something instead of nothing. Why? And the second question that this teaching answers is who are we? As human beings, who are we? Because the only way that we can ever really find out who we are is from the one who created us, our creator God. And everything else that we believe about ourselves and what is around us flows from the answers to those two questions. Why am I and who am I? Because if everything around us, including ourselves, is the result of random, meaningless occurrences, then that says something about who I am. If that's the case, then the only dignity or honor that we give to human beings is pure, subjective sentimentality. Because in that world, in reality, a human life is of no more inherent value than that of a worm's. And there's no greater law than survival of the fittest. But friends, that is not what the Bible teaches. So if you're able, would you please stand with me in honor and reverence of the reading of God's word. Again, we're in Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 1, and then we'll jump down to verse 26. In the beginning... 
God created the heavens and the earth. Then down to verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The Bible begins with a very simple statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the first sentence of the Bible. The subject of the first sentence of the Bible is God. In the beginning, God. So we're going to begin this message of creation by talking about God. Because with those four words, in the beginning, God, we learn that before there ever was a beginning, God existed. Before anything existed, there was God. Now I know, I can already hear some of you thinking, Dan, we spent the last three weeks talking about God. Why are you talking about God again? We're supposed to be talking about creation this week, not about God, and I hear that. But before we can understand the purpose and function of creation, we need to understand the kind of creator that did the creating. So what does this passage teach us about our creator God? First, as I already said, he existed before the beginning. Our God is not a part of creation. He is not dependent on creation. Before the beginning of creation, God was there. So he existed before creation. Second, he existed in multiple persons before creation. We spent the last three weeks talking about the Trinity, about the fact that the God of the Bible is one God who exists in three persons. And we see that hinted to, though not outright taught, in the first chapter of Genesis. There's a lot of stuff going on in the Hebrew of Genesis 1, so I won't talk about all of it, but it comes out most clearly in verse 26 and 27 of Genesis 1. So here. Then God said, let us, God is an us, let us, plural, make man in our, plural, image, after our Likeness, plural. Then in verse 27, God created, in the Hebrew that verb is singular, man in his own image, singular again. In the image of God, he, singular, created him. Male and female, he, singular, created them. Something is going on here. Somehow in one verse, God is plural, in the next verse, he is singular. The very next verse So either what's happening is there was some sort of grammatical error in the first chapter of the Bible, unfortunate way to start, um, that has never been corrected over the thousands and thousands of years that people have been looking at this text, or it's suggesting something interesting about this creator God. He is somehow both plural and singular. One God Three persons. Now, why does that matter for creation? Well, it means that God did not create in order to fulfill a need in himself. God did not create because he was lonely. If you're a Beatles fan, it means that God did not create because he needed somebody to love. <clears throat> Rather, God created out of his love. And that's the first point here, out of his love. Our creator is loving. He is three persons. That means that it is possible for him to love without creation. Because every person of the Trinity would be loving the other persons of the Trinity. That's why the Bible says God is love. Love is a fundamental part of God's nature, and our God, the Christian God, is the only God that can actually be love, because our God is the only God that is three and one. So again, we're talking about creation today, and a message about creation 
Why does it matter that God created out of his love? When we say that God created out of his love, we are saying that God did not need creation for anything. Rather, all of creation is an overflow of God's love. In fact, in the Greek Old Testament, the word that is translated into our English Bibles as created is translated from Hebrew into Greek as the word poieo, which, mean, which is where we get our English word poem from. So you could say that all of creation, everything that you've seen, everything in creation, everything in the universe is a huge love poem written by our God, our God who is both plural and singular. So creation is an expression of love that was already present in God from the beginning. And that's why everything in the beginning was perfect. All things, as they leave God's hands, are good. And that's because God creates out of his love. So God didn't create to get something out of creation. Rather, he did it to express his love his power, and his glory. And it's out of that, out of that love that God created. And that's the second point. God created. The Bible simply, clearly, and amazingly states that the universe did not create itself. That the universe does not exist by accident. That you, child of God, do not exist by accident. You were lovingly and carefully created by a loving and caring Heavenly Father. Just think about that for a second. Because sometimes we can just blast past that first verse of the Bible because we've heard it so often, we've almost become numb to it. But the Bible teaches that everything, everything in the universe and beyond was created intentionally by the word of the eternal God. That brings us to our next point. God created everything. The heavens and the earth, it says. And when it says the heavens, that's not just talking about the heaven that we go to when we die. It's also talking about the sky that we can see, the blue sky that we can see. And it's talking about space and everything in space. And it's talking about that spiritual heaven. All, all of those include, are included in the heavens. So when, when the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth, that little phrase is a huge event. Those nine little words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, announce a staggering, powerful God. So he created everything. And not only did he create everything, but he did it out of Nothing. If you speak Latin, you would say God created ex nihilo. This means that that God did not create out of anything that already existed. Rather, in the beginning, the Bible teaches that there was nothing, God spoke, and then there was everything. In the beginning, matter did not exist, God spoke, and then all matter existed. And that's what Hebrews 11 verse 3 says. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the, what? Word of God. So that what is seen is not made out of things that are visible. God created everything out of nothing. And he did it out of his love. So that answers the first question, right? The question of why is there something instead of nothing? But it doesn't answer that second question that we asked this morning. Why do I, or who are we as humans? For that, the Bible gives us verses 26 and 28. The Bible teaches that that God created everything, but it also teaches that he created us. And we are unique, we are different, we are set apart from the rest of creation. The Bible tells us that God created humanity, both male and female, in his image. In his image. As humans, we are created in the image and the likeness of God. So what does that actually mean? There's a lot of things. A lot of things you could say about this. I'll just say a couple. First, it means that we are created to represent God on earth. 
We see that really clearly in verse 26. God gives humanity his authority to rule or have dominion over the earth and all the creatures in it. Subdue the earth, have dominion over it. And to me, that's, that's amazing. That's crazy to me that our God chose to do it that way. Our God has chosen to partner with humanity, to have us participate in the work of spreading his glory throughout the earth, which is, which is a job that he could have done perfectly by himself, but instead he chooses to partner with us. God has chosen to use us to fill the earth with his glory. And at that time, in the beginning, the primary way that humans were called to fill the earth with his glory were, was having children, filling the earth with a bunch of little people made in God's image. But uh, in the church age, today, our last orders that we received are from Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, and now this is how we fill the earth with God's glory. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you even to the end of the age." That is how we represent God on earth now. We are calling people to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We are calling people to more perfectly reflect the image of God. We are created to represent God on earth. Second, we are created as spiritual creatures. And this sets humanity apart from all other, from all animals. The Bible teaches very clearly that you as a human are not just a clever monkey. You are born, you are created with a spirit. And that spirituality comes with some huge implications. To name a few, you, you have a will. You have the ability to choose to do right or to do wrong. As humans, people made in the image of God, we have a choice to make. We were created with creativity because our God is a creative God. I mean, if you look around at creation around you, you can see how creative our God is. Look around at some of the people that God has created. You can see how creative our God is. (laughs) That was a a joke. Um, You're all beautiful. But, and we create out of God's creation. You think of an artist who uses pigments or graphite or whatever it is to make beautiful things to glorify God. You can think of of an architect or a builder who who builds things with the resources that God has given them. You can think of of musicians who use the airwaves that God has given us to make music that glorifies God. As humans, we are creative because our God is creative. And the last thing I'm I'm going to touch on, um, there's a lot more that we could say here, but I want to say this. Because we have spirits that are made in the image of God, because we are spiritual creatures, we are created with a desire to worship. God created us to commune with him. And as humans, subconsciously, we desperately desire to be a part of something that is larger than ourselves. We desperately desire to be fully known and fully loved. We desire to praise and worship him, ultimately, because humanity is made to be in relationship with God. That desire was given to us by God, and the Bible tells us that God is spirit, And his worshipers must therefore worship him in truth and what? Spirit. Right. So us being made in God's image means that we are created as spiritual creatures. Thirdly, we are created with fundamental human dignity. The Bible teaches that humanity is incredibly precious in God's eyes. Every human from conception until death, is seen as a precious creation made in God's image. So friend, that means that you are incredibly precious in God's eyes. Your neighbor, the person sitting next to you, 
is incredibly precious in God's eyes. Your enemy is incredibly precious in God's eyes because in some significant way, even as broken or as sinful as they are, they still look like their heavenly father. So as Christians, we believe that all people are created with fundamental human dignity and are valued by God. Fourthly, and lastly, our being made in God's image means that we are created as relational beings. Because our God is a relational God. He has always been in fellowship with himself in the Trinity. And because we are made in that image, we are also designed for fellowship with God and with one another. It is not good that man should be alone. You are designed, you are not designed to live life alone. No matter what the devil tells you, no matter how unworthy you feel to be in community, no matter how obnoxious other people can be at times, you were not designed to live life alone. So God created. He created out of his love. He created everything out of nothing and he created mankind in his own image. Amazing. These are really amazing doctrines, really great theology. But why does this doctrine of creation, this teaching about creation, matter to me in my daily life? Well, first, it encourages us to trust God. He created all things. He knows what he's doing. He is the potter. We are the clay. And we can see this application really clearly in the book of Job. Many of us know the story of Job. Job was a good guy who a lot of bad things happened to. He got horribly sick, painful sores all over his body. He lost all of his house and home and wealth. He lost all of his children. His friends told him that it was his fault that these things were happening to him. His wife, after all this, essentially told him to kill himself. So Job, in this moment of his, the most desperate time in his life, he looks up to God and says, God, what is going on? How can I trust you? Are you right to do this? And we actually have God's recorded answer in the book of Job. God says, Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth. Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or on who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? God points Job back to creation. He says, do you remember what I did? You know that I've created all things. He points to his joy, his love, his power in creation. He lovingly reminds Job and us that he is God and we are not. God created all things. He sees the whole picture. He sees the bird's eye view, which we don't see, but he also sees every last minute detail. The love and power of our God revealed through creation encourages us to place our trust in him. So it encourages us to trust our God. A biblical doctrine of creation also calls me to respect my neighbor. To respect my neighbor. Let me read you a quote from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis says, it is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, little g, he's talking about humans there, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to 
may one day be a creature which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. Or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All the day long, we are, in some degree, helping each other towards one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another. All friendships, all loves, all play, all politics, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. We believe that human beings are made in the image of God. And that means that all human life should be seen as incredibly precious. Did you hear that, Christian? All human life. And this might be the most relevant message that you can take home with you today. Because not only did God create you in his image, but he created people with special needs in his image. He created the foreigner, the stranger, the immigrant in his image. He created the elderly, aging people in his image. He created the unborn, people who are still in their mother's womb, some of the most defenseless people in our society are in God's image. So as Christians, we are called not only to see every human life as precious, but also to protect and advocate for those lives who may not be able to protect and advocate for themselves, not because it makes us feel good, not because it's of, it's of any benefit to us, but because all human life is made in the image of God. This doctrine, this teaching calls us to respect our neighbors. And the doctrine of creation also pushes me to more perfectly reflect God's image. That's why we were created, remember, to, to reflect, to represent God and his glory on earth. Now, we also know that this world is fallen and sinful. Even our ability to image God has been marred by the fall. But the Bible tells us that even in this fallen world, there is good news. God has made for us a way to get back to how things were. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, Paul says, and we all, talking to Christians there, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same, what? Image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. If we are made in the image of God, then our goal in life should be to look like we are made in the image of God. And the Bible teaches that the only way we can do that is by being transformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And we're only able to do that from the Lord who is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so here's an application. If you're here today and you have not put your trust in Jesus Christ alone. If you do not know him as Lord of your life, I want to encourage you to do that now. Because he is the only one who can solve this sin problem in our lives. 
And if you're here today and you do know Jesus, you are in a relationship with the author of the universe, then I want to encourage you to trust the Holy Spirit to conform you to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. To walk in step with him so you can actually live out this image like we were meant to. So it encourages us to perfectly reflect the image, to more perfectly reflect the image of God. And lastly, and this is, I actually mean lastly this time, teaching about creation inspires us to worship the God of creation. When we see the awesome power of God in creation, we should stand amazed. Amazed at the fact that there was nothing God spoke, then there was everything. At his goodness for creating a universe, a world so beautiful and hospitable. And we find this theme all over the Psalms. In Psalm 33, verses 6 through 9, it says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Why? For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. All of creation and declares the glory of its creator. One weekend, recently, I was at a friend's house, and a friend is, my friend is an astronomy guy, so he has a, a pretty expensive, pretty fancy telescope. So we went out, it was nighttime, and uh, that night you could see Saturn, and I think it was Venus. Um, so we, we got out there, and, and this was a really nice telescope, so you could like see the rings on Saturn. I mean, you could see how huge this thing really was. And as we were walking back to the house after looking at that, my friend told me, man, just looking at that stuff makes me realize how small I am. It makes me feel almost like insignificant. How could I matter in a universe this big? And I can understand that feeling. Our universe is unimaginably huge. But friend, the, the vastness of God's creation shouldn't make us look at ourselves and how small we are. But it should make us look up and see how amazing our God really is. When we look at the canvas of creation, we see God's signature. That should point us to him, we should stand in awe of him, like Psalm 33 says. And that's why Romans 1.20 says that creation teaches all of humanity about God. Anyone can learn something about God simply by looking around at what our God has made. So, back to those original two questions. Why does anything exist? Because God created everything out of his love. God created everything out of nothing. And because of that, our God is worthy of worship and praise. And then, who are we? Who are you? Who am I? You are a precious creation made in the image of God. Made in the image of the God who created everything. Now, of course, in this world, we know that it has fallen, and we'll talk a lot more about that next week. But suffice it to say that in this fallen world, that image that you were created in has been warped. You are a mirror that was uniquely designed to reflect God's glory, but that mirror has been scratched and cracked because of the sin in this broken world. But if you believe in Jesus, and here's the hope, the Bible tells us that we can look forward to a recreation. 
When God, instead of throwing us out for our brokenness, because in our consumer culture, that's what we tend to do with broken things, is throw them out. But instead of throwing us out, God is going to come and heal our broken parts so that we can perfectly reflect him again. Man, we have an amazing future to look forward to. I'll close with with this. I'll close with the this I believe statement. We have one of these every week. I believe God created a good universe out of nothing and formed human beings in his own image. What an amazing truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I stand all amazed at your goodness, at your power, at your glory. You have given us such a privilege and such a responsibility as creatures made in your image, and we failed. But God, I also stand all amazed at the love Jesus offers me. I pray that as we leave this place, we would leave it singing your praises. Singing the praises of the God who created all things out of nothing. And I pray that we would leave this place with a different perspective on one another. That we would more fully appreciate the fact that every human life was made in your image. I ask all these things in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen.